What is up, Thrive Fam? CJ Finley here again with another episode of the Thrive in Life podcast. And today joining me is Peter Nelson, the founder of Sisu Sauna and co-founder of Black Flag Athletics outside of Ohio. Tuning in virtually with me here today, and I'm super stoked because I've been using the Sisu Sauna for about five to six months now, and it's been a game changer to my lifestyle. Um, and just super excited to get, kick this off. But how are you doing today, Peter? Man, I'm really, really good. This is like an absolute pleasure to be uh, jumping on here with you. You've built quite the brand with uh, Thrive on Life, man. So I know through our conversations in the past, uh, we've I've always said like, man, we should hold off a little bit here just to throw this into a podcast at some point because I I really think that what you what you speak on and what you preach and then just some of the stupidity that has um, been on my end, you know, I think it'd be worth a podcast together. Hell yeah! And I still remember the first phone call we had. We literally could have probably recorded. The phone call um, and that would have been <laughs> yeah. valuable to other people i was trying to for those listening like i was trying to hold off P uh, peter was potentially coming out to austin and we were going to get him in the studio but i just decided well, let's just rip it and then we'll just run it back again uh whenever you make it out here but first question i have for you here today is much like myself you seem to be integrated in multiple different projects as well as your a loving husband and father i'm soon to be a father i uh, haven't taken that label just yet um, but I'm going to be juggling a lot of different things on top of my family, which would be you're working on Sisu and Black Flag, and then you're also an ultra runner and get after it yourself. So I'd love to know, how does Peter define success? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. I think, um, you know, kind of unboxing that question a little bit, there's a lot of priorities in people's lives and you have to figure out around those priorities if the things that are not a priority, if they're even worth your time. And I think that that's where you have to start to be extremely cautious with how you spend your time on specific things and learning to say no. You know, if as a husband, first and foremost, it's like my number one title is, is being a husband to my beautiful wife, Paige, uh, who's pregnant. And, you know, any day right now, we could be having baby number two uh, and being a father, being number two of that of that title. Those are like the number. Those are the top two things, truly, because, you know, business is great. You know, we're able to change lives. But at the end of the day, like my legacy is meant to be within this family. And I want there to be this like generational uh, thing where I just view like our kids and their kids always, you know, looking up to me one day saying like he went about life the right way. So the way I view success is first and foremost, having the most fun with our family, not just my wife, but also our kids and our extended family. None of this is worth it unless if that's prioritized first. Uh, secondly, I truly believe that if we do it authentically and we approach work the right way from the goodness of our heart, we could truly change lives. So the way I view success in that bucket within the professional spectrum is that I truly want to change lives through health and wellness. Like that's my overall mi mission from a from a business uh, venture side is that. We've got a great gym brand where we're able to influence people on a very direct basis. And then we've got this great growing sauna brand where now we're, you know, we're extended beyond our four walls of a, of a gym here in Cleveland. And now we've got sauna traveling all throughout the United States and soon to be other markets. And I think that, you know, through this process, I've, I thought starting off success was like, all right, I'm going to, you know, I want to make six figures and, you know, retire when I'm 50. And it's like, no, dude, like, that's not the point, <laughs> you know, the whole point of success and what I view as success is like this, you know, there's never an end mark on success. It's having purpose and waking up every day with priority and purpose and genuinely feeling like you're fulfilled with that purpose. I don't need to be happy to feel fulfilled. Like there's a lot of times in life where I'm not happy, but man, because like it's that type two type of fun, like I'm grinding to make something happen. And I get that satisfaction, that fulfillment at the end, like that's success. So, you know, first and foremost, taking care of my family. And then secondly is all of that, all of the business. And third, this, my number three used to be my number two, but I realized that for number two to happen, the, the business part, I need to be able to take care of my family. That third part is my health and my wellness. So every single week I'll sit down and I'll, I'll look at my schedule and I'll make sure I have my family time scheduled out, my business time scheduled out and all my health. So I'm an ultra runner, uh, since I was 17, uh, I love strength training concurrently with that. So being able to lift heavy while doing this, it's just so fun to me. And so I have to find time throughout the day 
to be able to plug into myself because if I'm not plugging into myself, I can't plug into other people. So that's just a part of me that is just, it's innate. It's something I got from my dad and it's something that I find gives me ultimate level of success because there's something about trying to juggle all of it and making it all happen. That's just so worthwhile. I love that last part there because I'm learning that right now where uh, health and fitness are my number two as well. Um, and for anybody out there, I want to clarify when Peter says three, cause I, I know what you mean by this. It doesn't mean that it's not getting done. It just means that that's going to be scheduled in whenever he can make it happen. So I'm trying to train myself so that my fitness, it'll still get done, but I'm now adapting. When is that fitness going to happen? Rather, it used to be happened whenever I wanted it to happen. That was the, that was the pillar. Um, so it's interesting that you stated that. I love how you broke that down, but something intrigued me. You mentioned, uh, having the most fun possible with your family. What does fun look like to the Nelson family? <laughs> oh man. Uh, yesterday was a perfect case. So, um, my son, he's about to be two. Uh, he loves being outside and he loves tools. Like he behind us, so you got like that little like Bosch tool set over there. Anytime we're like we're doing like a project around the house or you know doing something fitness oriented, he always has tools with himself and he's always running around like like a chicken with his head cut off. <laughs> uh, I was a basketball player like in a past life, like I love basketball, and so um, you know for us it's being active because obviously that's a core tenant to my wife and I. So we want to make sure that that's exuded in our kids. Uh, we want to make sure like our kids are polite. We want to make sure that the kids are you know well respected, but they also respect other people. So. You know, for us, like what fun looks like to us is that we're active, we're cooking at home, we're not necessarily going out to eat. Now, don't get me wrong, we still go out to eat, but you know, cooking meals together. Like I love looping in our son or our family in, like together as uh, as a whole in the kitchen cooking. Uh, we love, you know, for our for our angle, being able to go to the gym, being able to spend more time with family. Like again, I was telling you about my dad. I mean, my dad, my dad's a legend. Uh, same thing with my mom. But specifically with my dad's health scenario right now, and we can go into this later, being able to spend time with him, that's so much fun to us because just like in his health scenario right now, being being able to get our son in front of my dad and being able to just spend time with him right now is just, it's so much fun because my dad's on the mend and my son's so impressionable. So like the little things that you don't think about, you know, that you do every single day, your son picks up on it. So you know, we go over to his house, we're talking about running, and then we go to walk around or run around the block together with my son, my dad and I, and my dad or my son's pointing at my dad's shoes or his feet to be like, go ahead and run. And so he knows that my dad's a runner. <laughs> so he's pointing at my dad's shoes to say, go ahead and run. It's just so special. That's amazing. So, but yeah, I mean, again, staying active, yeah. um, staying active making food together, uh, getting out and enjoying just life together out here in Cleveland. Cleveland has, it's very, very low cost of living here. We love living here. Uh, so we're always out in the parks. We're always out on trails. We're always going to coffee shops. It's just so much fun. So just trying to live and live life and not just be combined to, you know, your phone and your laptop and being inside. Yeah, that's amazing. It's, it, it hits home a lot. Um, Aaron's father, was a runner and he was an athlete. And one of the things that's hitting home with us right now is, um, my son, his would have been grandson, um, doesn't get to do that stuff. So it, it's cool to hear coming from you where that, that is happening. And it's something that I want to experience when I'm 60, 70 years old. So one of the passions of fitness and health that I have is because I've already thought through to the future of that and seeing people do that live presently right now is is very fulfilling to me and it sounds like a hell of a lot of fun and that's one of the things that i'm i'm very much looking forward to uh, when aiden is born is just spending more time doing the little things and enjoying those little things but i'd love to kick this into a little bit more of the business realm yeah. anybody that's listening i send a form out um to every guest prior to coming on and i absolutely loved your response Peter, to the question of how can our Thrive community best support you? Uh, you mentioned spreading the message of what it means to operate on passion and purpose and not for money. And one of the things that Thrive that I've been saying for years is like purpose before profit. What does that look like practically though? Because when people hear that, like the biggest rebuttal is, yeah, but you need, you need money to operate 
a business, but what does it look like practically? Um, and you can tell a story here in Black Flag or in Sisu to operate with purpose before that profit. And then obviously you are operating to make money and continue to scale that, that purpose. Yeah. Well, um, I love the purpose before profit, but there's also another saying, and I don't want to butcher it, but it's, um, uh, profit, uh, you know, profit allows us to have ministry. So it's like the idea that profit allows us to do mm-hmm. good. Right. So that's just something to consider. Um, a good business is one that takes their money and puts it to good use. So not just like, let's say you have a really great product or a really great service and you want more people to feel that experience of the product or service. Well, a good business would double down on what they're already doing. They're not going to reinvent the wheel. They're just going to replicate what they're doing so more people could experience it. So that's something that's extremely important is that passion and purpose to us means that we're fulfilling our mission of being good stewards of the wood for sauna, right? And creating great and exceptional sauna experiences for people. And so for us, again, I don't, I really don't care about the financial part right now. I just genuinely want more people to be in the sauna because I know how great the benefits are. And I'm not just saying any sauna, like the reason why we've put and hand tailored this specific sauna experience with Sisu is that we know that people aren't going to be able to adapt with a 230 degree plus heater. Like it's physiologically impossible. You know, it's just, you just can't make that happen. Um, you know, for us to be able to have Amish craftsmanship, you know, I want people to have like an experience when they're building out that it's fun. There's, I still, I still remember building our first sauna out, uh, not Sisu, but a, a prior manufacturers before when we were a dealer where it took me two days plus, and that didn't even include the electrical. So I just remember these pro I just remember this, like the, um, the opportunities to learn. And as we were going to pivot into manufacturing ourselves specifically with Sisu, again, the passion and purpose was really evident in that, you know, we want to learn from our past mistakes and our past uh, opportunities to learn and create an experience that will affect people's lives, not just for the next year, but for the next 10 plus years. So again, the passion and purpose comes from us just genuinely wanting people to have a great experience that's going to change their lifestyle. And there's nothing greater than creating a product or an experience that genuinely changes somebody's lifestyle for the better, because all of a sudden that means that they're going from like 80% threshold to 90% threshold in their life or whatever that is, that next step because of a product that you're creating. That to us means way more than being able to, you know, patent our, our, our bank accounts at the end of the day. Beautifully said. And I have a story that actually acknowledges this, two of them actually with my family. When my brother was uh, visiting with his wife out in Austin, Texas, I took him to the saunas we have at Squatch Fitness and we did sauna and ice. It was his first time doing the, the contrast therapy. And when he went home, he actually built a sauna and ice bath in his garage. And that was the first time he's ever done it was when he visited us in, in May of last year. And then he goes home and he builds it in his garage. Uh, and then my parents came out here in December and they got to spend an extended period of time with me and they actually got to experience the Sisu sauna. Um, and it was to the point where like, they saw me going into it and then obviously I wasn't here 24 seven. So they would be here and they, my dad started to ask me like, Hey, can I like go turn it on and go enjoy it with your mom when you're not here? And I'm like, of awesome. course. Um, and that <laughs> led great. to this ripple effect of like, he started using the red light that I have. And then yeah. By the third week, he literally went and got blood work with me. And the, something that the Sisu does and why I'm so such a proponent of the purpose of sauna and, and propelling that is you feel it. And it's one thing to tell people what to do, like you should eat good or you should exercise. It's another thing to have them experience something where you immediately feel better. And then they're making the decision for themselves. Oh, I feel better. So I want to use this modality. And then they start questioning like what other modalities uh, could I potentially partake in? Um, but as you were starting this uh, company, so Sisu Manufacturing on your own, and then also Black Flag, which you're affiliated with, if you could go back and say today was day one and tell yourself a couple things, what would they be? Because somebody out there right now is starting a brand or starting a business. And we don't always have the foresight to be like, okay, this is what I wouldn't do. Yeah. I think that's a really good question. And, um, 
just like as I'm hearing you talk, there's like a couple things that just pop into my head right away. Uh, one, I, I've never been a guy where I look back and I have regrets because anything that was an opportunity for me to learn, whether that was my non, non diligence of doing something or me making a bad mistake or making a poor decision that led me to potentially making a better decision. So my, one of my core ethos is never repeating the same mistake. So learn from the mistake and then move on because any, any great successful person from my understanding you know, they're super consistent, but they make mistakes a lot or they may, they have a lot of opportunities to learn and then they refine their patterns. So, um, but there's a, there's a couple things where at the start, I wish I would have done earlier one. I wish, or I, I and this is not a regret. This is just something where I think back upon that. I could have jump started my career probably even quicker or got connected into bigger, you know, networks quicker. I wish I would have authentically been myself sooner at the start, less of trying to make people happy just for the sake of them being happy and content versus giving them myself and my candid feedback earlier. So I think back earlier in my career, I was around a lot specifically, uh, this was before sauna, uh, in the gym environment where there could have been potentially people that are twice my age, three times my age. I know CJ, you're in our similar age. Um, there's, there was times where because they were older, I was just like, oh, well, they potentially know more than me or along the lines of they felt like they were way older than me and they felt like they could just come down to me and just give me all the crap. And so it was one of those things where I wish I would have authentically from my own self, just like, like, hey, this is what I believe. This is the direction that we're going. This is my decision. We're going to stick with it. So, but again, at, that's how you, you have to get reps as a leader. And as you get reps as a leader, you have to go through experiences like that to know uh, how to, how to go about certain situations. So again, being authentically myself earlier, um, I wish I would have stick with ideas longer rather than quickly, you know, I'm, I'm a guy who always has ideas, but to let like real good ideas marinate and let them take their time and let them and, and delegate out. That's huge. So if there's an idea, let's say we want to host some crazy event, not having to take all the all the burden onto myself and then create this huge function. I should have enlisted a bunch of help for people who are super passionate about doing something very similar to create a huge event with a group of people that are all again, passionate about what we're doing and have a purpose for doing it. So that's something else was and that tailors into the, the third idea is delegation. I think delegation is one of the, the true core principles of scaling a business and a brand is being able to get people who are super invested into your mission and your purpose, have a genuine passion for, um, for one to do whatever the work is within the company and giving them the, the rights and the ability to make mistakes along the way, and then give them the core, like that culture, that, that ethos that, you know, we're trying to develop is it's okay to make mistakes. Like it's actually super important because that's how you, that's how you, you evolve. But from there, to be like, all right, like, what are we going to do to not repeat that same mistake to make this experience not just better for yourself, but for eventually our customers? So that that delegation side is absolutely massive. And the one thing that, and this is, there's one takeaway that I would recommend that anybody have from, you know, this conversation. I got this from my business partner with Sisu, Nick Dadis. Uh, he's a bona fide entrepreneur. He would be a great guy to have on your pod podcast, CJ. We always talk about GWCs. Let's do it. A, a, yes, I'll, I'll link you guys. A GWC is a person who gets it, wants it, and has the capacity to do it. So when you're hiring somebody, do they actually get the material that, like, do they actually get it? Like, do they, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get them to do financial work within Sister. Like, is that an area that they actually get? Great. Do they want it? Like, do they genuinely want to do this position? Because otherwise, it's probably not a good hire and you'll only get a half-assed effort. Then lastly is the capacity to do it. Does this person get it? Yeah, they do. Do they want it? Yeah, they do. But in what in what capacity are they actually going to be able to do it with the hours in their day if they already have two other jobs or they have a job and they've got a massive family, right? So if we're going to hire the right people, we should have looked at this way earlier on. We've had a lot of hires within Black Flag that were amazing people. Um, but some of them never had the capacity to be able to get into the the amount of work that, that 
was required of them. And that was back, that comes back on us. That's our responsibility uh, to have known that. So now we go through with a fine tooth comb with any hire, with any business that we do. Do they get it? Do they want it? Do they have the capacity to do it? And if they do and they check off all the boxes, it's probably going to be a really good hire. I love that. And I've never heard that before. So let's dig a little into that. What does that look like in a practical setting? So if I'm looking to be hired by you and Sisu or Black Flag, how can you test whether I have the GWC? Yeah. So first, you'll never go into a situation unless you feel like there's a need, right? So we, mm. we, have a, we have a much larger team now than back when you purchased a sauna with us. But what we've noticed is as you scale, there's always a need for something to be potentially done better, right? So the way I view it is I, I am not a marketer. I am not a financial guy. I'm not the order manager. Like I can do all of those, but that doesn't mean that I should do it. But if that means that I could do all of them, but probably not to the best of what somebody else could do, that probably means I should probably delegate out. So for us, there's a couple criteria for us to start delegating out. Is there a need for it? And do we have cash flow for it? If we have those two things, then let's go ahead and, and create that position. So for us, we'll then look at, all right, like specifically for content and photo and video, right? That's huge for our Instagram, uh, email and, and uh, um, soon to be TikTok and all of our other platforms, web development. You know, I can only do so much on my phone right? Again, I'm not like, I'm not a content creative, you know? Uh, but there's people out there that are way better than me at it. And there's people out there that have a genuine passion for it. Okay. So now that we have that and we know that we have cash flow, and we need to make sure that we're fulfilling these things. All right, let's start looking at photographers and videographers. Do they get it? Of course. Like if we're going to talk with a, a photographer and, and videographer and I've seen their work, I know that they get it right. I'm, we're not just going to hire just somebody random. Like it has to be, you know, viscerally, from the gut like of the right fit so do they get it great do they want it like do they actually want to be part of our brand right and it's not just like yeah i want it because i want the pay you could sniff that out right away right so for us it's finding the want for them is yeah i have a de genuine desire to display your product and display your experiences in a way that's going to capture sales for us to be able to get our product in front of more people changing more lives great there's the want and now majority of photographers are freelancers, right? So are they going to have time or videographers, are they, are they going to have time throughout their whole schedule to make this happen? So those are things that we start to look through and it allows us to be able to really pinpoint exactly who's going to be the best fit and who's not going to be the best fit. So it just allows us not to have to make the wrong hire. It allows us to make the right hire very efficiently and very quickly. How do you decipher whether a need is ego-based versus an actual need in the business? Because I feel a lot of people, especially some of the projects and business partners I've dealt with in the past, sometimes they end up, when they do get the cash flow, spending it on things that they think they need, but weren't necessarily going to push the, the needle for the business forward. How have y'all navigated that over the course of growing two businesses how do you decipher like what is a true need in the business? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if it's just me and where I, we've really relied on my gut to just be like, this is the right move. But to me, it's very, very simple. I think, and again, this is, this is where it comes back to having a, a mission and values and seeing what, what is working and what's not working and spending more money in the area that is working. Right. So for us, it's, we've got, two products about to be a third product out there. Both the products do really, really well for us right now. Why would we want to, you know, change what we're currently doing? Right. So how, instead of like, let's say we're finding success, instead of trying to reinvent the wheel, why not just try to amplify it? So for us, it's like, we know what our mission is. We know what our values are. We know what our priorities are. Why not just amplify those even further? And that's how we're going to go from, you know, here to here is being able to amplify what we currently do. So, you know, to us, it's never, ever ego-based because like we would never hire somebody that's ego-based. You know what I mean? Like that's something that like we found like right away, like we just don't, that's just not us. That's not the cultures that we're developing or anything. So instead for us to, 
you know, take more of a deep dive look into, all right, what is going to generate cash flow for us to be able to do more good with it? All right. So let, let's look at web development. How is like, how are conversion rates going? Like are people spending enough time on specific pages that they should be spending time on? All right. So maybe we need, you know, for us, like the conversion rate isn't, isn't what we want it to be. So now we're investing more into that. Uh, so it's one of the reasons why like we hired on like an interim CMO, um, who's like remote, who's doing great work for us. Uh, we know that, you know, again, like going back and using Tim, who's our content in-house content creator now, seeing his work now amplify the brand compared to where we were just using Strap UGC for like four months. You know, now it's all of a sudden like we hired him on and now we're seeing uh, in an increase in sales. And there's a reason why, you know, because it's just amplifying our current values and our mission. And it's just now in front of more people. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. I just think, I think that you know, the amplification of the current you hit the nail on the head is where it needs to be. Yeah. You hit the nail on the head. Um, one going with your gut. I think too many people overthink it or they listen to somebody else out there, but also Hermosi has a saying, it's just like invest in what's working and forget the rest. Yeah. So it's, I think do enough in the beginning where, because you have such a vast amount of experience in different lanes, you're picking up so many different things and you you see immediately what works and what doesn't versus I think a lot of people have a fear of picking multiple things up and they do one thing and if it doesn't work, then they're scared to do another thing. Or if they do do one thing and it works just a little bit, they haven't done enough elsewhere to understand, wait, is this working because it's truly working or is it just working because it's the only thing I'm doing? Um, where have you learned over the years how to pick up and manage multiple different things and to do everything that you're saying, because it's not easy. I know like when you're working on multiple projects and you have the pillars that you have in your life, it's one thing to say them. It's another thing to do them. Are you operating off of any like project management softwares or how are you managing working in two different companies and on two different companies uh, in your daily life? What does that look like? Yeah. Um, I think, well, well, first, first case uh, or first, point here for anybody who's listening i think it's really important to never uh, i'm sure you guys have all have heard this never compare your step one to somebody's step 100 or somebody's step 50 mm. you know so ne never never do that uh comparisons the thief the thief of joy i've been guilty of that so many times uh, i see people that are building great brands i'm like man i wish i was there right now but it's like Little do you know that it's not the outcome that you're seeing from them that you want. It's actually the process of going from where you're at to there that makes you somebody who could be very exceptional in life. Um, but that said, I think that it's never, again, being able to find your priorities and just really double down on your priorities and know what actually makes you tick every day, what, what actually makes you want to wake up and attack life. I think that that's super important to just note and always have that visible. So I actually, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the EOS system, entrepreneurial operating system, but that's how we operate. Traction. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's how we operate black flag and Sisu. And I actually, because I've just utilized those systems for so long now with both businesses that I actually integrate that same system into my personal life. So Every day, it's very, very simple. Instead of, I used to have a handwritten task list in like a moleskin notebook, but now it's actually in a sheets, like on Google Sheets, where every day I create a new tab. It's with that date. And at the top, it just carries over all the same exact information my mission, my purpose, my values, what my goals are for the year. And then from underneath there, it's my personal life, which includes faith, fitness, family, uh, home, and schedule. And then I got anything from black flag and anything from Sisu. And so anything that doesn't get done on a given day just gets pulled right over to the next. And I don't feel guilty about not getting it done because it's like, we're all human. I'm doing my best to try to juggle all these things. But, and then again, at the same time, if I ever feel like I can't get all of my things that need to get done, then what I'll do is I'll find help and get some things delegated out. And eventually potent, you know, for me to potentially uh, delegate that out to a complete different, you know, position for somebody. So <clears throat> again, for, for my, you know, I guess you could say like project management or however you want to call it, I call it my personal L10 level 10 sheet. 
And again, all that is included with all my businesses, anything from a personal endeavor and all my all my values and my goals. And it's always there right in front of me every single morning. And my first 15 minutes of every single day when I get to work and it's actually now like clocking in for work, it's getting through and making sure that's all organized. And then I'll answer all my emails, messages, and then start siloing out throughout my day, whatever my tasks and objectives are within my task list uh, from a business a business and personal uh, perspective. Hell yeah. I, uh, I actually have traction sitting here on my, on my desk here. Uh, it's, a great book. it's something that I've utilized. Yeah. It's something that I've used. I, I like the frameworks in there back when I thought that I wanted to actually like be the one building companies, I think like six years ago, uh, until I realized that I really like kind of doing the, the podcast and the content side more so. And then the advising side, um, yeah. And and helping companies grow in that way, and but I still rely on on traction in in a million different ways. We actually have a quarterly meeting coming up on the fifth for one of the companies I'm working with, and we use the EOS system a little bit to move the needle forward there. So anybody listening, it's traction by Gino Wickman. I love that you you brought that up, Peter. Um, but I'd love to understand a little bit of how your your personal fitness journey has helped you as founder, CEO, father, and pulling some stories from that. Because for me, when I think back of the confidence that I have in the business in the business world and the ability to believe in myself, stepping into fatherhood and being a husband that I believe that I can be, a lot of it started with, I was a four sport athlete growing up. So I always love to talk with other athletes on any stories or any principles that they lived through sports that have carried over into the business world. Yeah, dude. Um, so it's so funny. You're a four sport athlete. I always say like, looking back, man, I should have played football. I should have played baseball. I was way better at baseball than I was at basketball, but I just found it to be really boring. And then football, <laughs> I found I then football because, um, our basketball coach told me that if I wanted to be the captain of the team, then I couldn't play football. It was just like, it was so old school. Um, I got my competitive nature from basketball. I just played it my entire life. Like truly have. Um, and then when I was 17, I had just signed a four-year ROTC scholarship and got signed to like a division three powerhouse in Kentucky. And, um, I like on a, I had like a, a, a hairline fracture in my right foot. Uh, so like I was out for, basically half of my senior season and that like at the very tail end my dad ran his first ever 100 mile race now quick like backstory on that my dad chain smoked from 18 to 48 okay and then at 48 which was consequently wow. the same time that i was 17 he started running half marathons and marathons quit cold turkey and started going after it and so now he's 59 and he's ran 140 plus marathons and ultra marathons, 100 milers, 50 milers, the whole thing. Um, but this all kind of got really kickstarted once he ran his first hundred. It was in the Outer Banks, and I was 17, just coming off of this like injury. And he asked if I wanted to help pace him for the last, you know, however many miles. You know, I could start. I could start. You know, legally from like the race rules, start pacing him at the 50 mile mark. So at the 50 mile mark, I started pacing him. Well, like, <laughs> I don't know why, but I just kept running and I kept running and I ran the whole last 50 miles with him. And like the prior, and now like when I say like ran, it's a loose like ran because if you've ever seen anybody run a hundred miles, it's like walk, run, and then you're like crawling at the end. Um, but I endured for like the 50 miles. And I remember specifically like the sensation, not just for my dad, because like, Dude, at 17 years old and you're seeing your dad run 100 miles, you're like, dude, my dad is the best, you know? For my yeah. angle, it was like, wow. well, that's so cool. But then it, for me, you know, the most I'd ever ran prior to that was seven miles. So I wasn't no like long distance runner or anything. But gosh, there was something so freaking, there was something that just lit me up on the inside where I was like, man, I'm leaving a lot on the table, like a lot on the table. So, a month later, I signed up for another 50K. <laughs> this was on my birthday. And the night prior, we were at the Cleveland Indians game. It was like dollar hot dog night. We're just crushing dogs. And we get home. It was a rain delay. We didn't get home till like 2 a.m. 
And then we had to be on the road at 4 a.m. to get down to Southern Ohio for this race. It was all trail. It was like 90 degrees, super humid. And I was like hurting like a dog. So my dad's running it with us. And it was a three looper, got a mile or a loop and a half in, and I wanted to quit so bad. And at this time, like I'm giving my myself the 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 option to quit. So I'm just like, Dad, I'm done, man. Like I'm like hurting so bad. And my dad, my dad was like, Get up, you big pussy. Like, let's keep going. I'm like, Oh shoot. You know, I can't let my dad who's double my age, you know, um, you know, tell me that I got to keep moving. So I hallucinated for the first time in my life on that run. Um, but eventually made it. And I crossed that finish line crying because in that moment, did I realize that, you know, what I thought I was truly capping out at was only 50% of the threshold that I actually exhibited that day. And so, you know, since then I've ran 25 ultras, um, tons of 50 milers, 50 Ks, a hundred, um, and I've failed a number of times at the 100-mile completion mark. And I'm so happy I went through these experiences because it was a huge life lesson across the, the five or so years of really dedicating myself to ultra and strength training concurrently. Uh, I would do CrossFit from time to time. Uh, would, you know, I would try to train for regionals at the time and get close or would try to train for, you know, make it to quarterfinals, but, you know, just to say that you do it. But there was something about running ultra in the process of preparing for it and learning how to schedule it and learning how to communicate it to your wife, who's like, you're an idiot. Why would you do this? You know, and then eventually for her to see it as a normal and now she's encouraging you to do it. Um, so <clears throat> through this whole endeavor into ultra for me. It, it, was, it was never the, I remember earlier on, it was always like, man, what would my life be like if I ran a hundred miles? Like, like what, what would I feel like? What would I be doing? And so it was always this super high arching goal. And I failed four times at it. And then when I eventually got and ran a hundred miles, I always was like, dude, like I'm going to be a freaking emotional mess when I finish a hundred miles. You know, it's, it's going to be like, I don't know what I'm going to do with myself. And I got there. And I crossed the line. I just did like one of these. And it wasn't it wasn't this huge wave of emotion. It was just like, all right, what's next? <laughs> it was this wild, like completely contradictory feeling from what you're anticipating. And I realized right then and there that it wasn't this outcome that I was chasing. It was actually the five years prior to it of how it changed my life completely in the process of waking up at 5 a.m. and tying my shoes. I don't want to run, but I got to go run. And then I have to be back at 6 a.m. because my son has to be up, and that's the only time I'm going to be able to get it done. And then you're like, all right, well, I'm going to have to run 55, 60 miles this week. The only way I'm going to be able to run and get this training, I'm now going to have to do it during my lunch breaks, or I'm going to have to do it really early in the morning. And so, <clears throat> again, it was a huge priority. And because it was a priority, I had to make time for it in my schedule and we made time for it. And it gave me the desired outcome eventually that I wanted. But again, looking back, it was always, I'm realizing now it was the process of going about that intended outcome that changed my, that changed my life, not the outcome itself. And I think that's a really important lesson for younger kids and younger athletes to know that it's, you know, high school sports are great. College sports are great. You know, winning championships is great. Being part of winning cultures is great. But if you start developing great habits and learn how to communicate effectively and learn how to schedule correctly and prioritize your time, that's what's going to carry well into your uh, professional career and your family life where you're going to start to make huge leaps and bounds um, and truly become like exceptional in what you do. Amazing story. I'm running my first 50K in December. So clearly don't eat a bunch of hot dogs before doing that <laughs> it, it, it was wild you know like those soggy hot dogs that come in like the tin foil oh my oh, god man it was terrible it was terrible that's like worse than probably being hung over like yeah oh i can't even imagine like i could yeah uh, soggy baseball hot dogs <laughs> yeah. the night before you're about to run your Did first like ultra is is not, not a story i was expecting here today, but it was the story that I needed. So I just know to stay away from the hot dogs before, before my ultra. But I, I really like how you broke that down. And one thing I think with your, your analogy, um, of 
kind of you're crossing the finish line. You had thought that you were going to be breaking down in a certain way, but I think because you had failed a couple times, it didn't like maybe it, it would have been different if like your first time you went out there and you crossed it. Maybe you had a different reaction, but. I think what sports does, and this is what we're lacking, I, I believe, in today's culture, both in sports and in the business world, is sports taught me how to lose. It didn't necessarily tell me how to win. What I mean by that is we lost all the time, and then we just went back to practice the next week and just kept, grind, kept grinding. There was no like thought in our minds like, oh, we're, we're, like, we're, we lost two games in a row. We're, like, the season's over. We're giving up. Like, that wasn't an option. And I feel like in today's world, a lot of people are granting themselves the option like you did on that. And then your dad kicked in. You granted yourself the option on that first mile, like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to stop. But in his mind, he'd already done so many that you're just like, oh, this is just another day. And I think that's what you got on the one that you did the hundred miles. Like, this is just another day. And now I'm going to go into another day of like, oh, I'm, I'm already a hundred miler guy what's next and we start learning i love how you talked about the process multiple times here is just this is just who we are this is just what i do and it's it's such an intriguing thing because i've experienced it myself it's just there it, the winning and the losing and whatever it's it is just whatever and people don't always understand what you mean by that but it's just what you are you, you literally wake up and you have your principles and you have your pillars in your life and whether it was leading you in the way to build saunas or build gyms or build whatever it is, you're going to be successful over the long run just by showing up in that principled manner. So I love how you broke that down. And I know we're getting close to, to time here. So we'll go with the last question um, before we go to a wrapping up. If we were to go five years ahead, 10 years ahead, and you are following these principles and these pillars, what are some cool things? Like, what are you aspiring to do? Because you are a dreamer, you're creative. What would some cool things be to say like, oh, we achieved this in five years or in 10 years? Because we've been mentioning, yeah, it's about the process and things like that. But there's definitely goals in my mind where I'm just like, yeah, like five years down the road, 10 years down the road, like it would be really cool to say X, Y, Z. And if I don't get there and I switch my goals, whatever. But in this moment, what are you thinking about, uh, whether it's in business or in your athletic endeavors? What's been on your mind lately of where that trajectory is going? I think the most important thing is when you think five to 10 years out, my wife and I will be married for 15 years at that point, right? So that gets mm -hmm. me really excited because that means that we'll probably have already had all of our kids and 10 years from now, our son will be 12, like on the precipice of going to high school. So he already has, you know, he's already had all the, um, the influence from his wife or his, his mom and his father and his family and all of his kids. So that's super important to us. Um, but another, one of the things that, you know, through, as I was talking about before, like profit equals ministry, it's for us to be able to give, you know, from this and to be able to provide people means that they wouldn't have otherwise, and not just from like a financial position, but in like an opportunity position. So there's something about developing culture and community and giving to things that I feel very passionate and purposeful with. So, you know, uh, my inaugural, uh, this year I'm hosting my first uh, ultra endurance challenge. It's like this sick, it's called Hell on Hogs Back. It's this sick hill in Cleveland. Um, and it's just down and up as many times as you can, 12 hours. It's wild. It's super difficult. I'm looking forward to it. But the purpose of it is, is that the ticket to get in is not just a ticket. It's a donation. So the donation goes all into one fund and then we're going to hand deliver a check to somebody who has cancer, who cannot afford their medical, um, who, who cannot, who cannot, um, uh, pay for their medical procedure. So, <clears throat> I found that through seeing my dad's experience with what he's going through right now with, with tongue cancer and then a really, really bad stroke where he had to relearn how to walk two months ago after all these ultras being able to try to relearn all that. So it was just wild. But anyways, this is like this hell on hogs back idea is an extension of our desire to give and give to people who are not as fortunate as us to be able to make an educated decision of whether or not they want to utilize that money 
for a surgery or some other procedure or not. So I think that that's like the start of potentially larger philanthropic ideas that might bring something to fruition 10 years from now. Um, because I know the importance of priority and delegation, I do see it. I do see myself potentially owning other businesses or investing in other businesses that align with my values and my mission. I don't know what those are. It, you know, I, if you would have told me a year ago or two years ago that I would have be a co-founder of a sauna company, I would have laughed at you. Like, I wouldn't even tell you like what, you know, why would I, why would I want to do that? But again, now you just don't know. <laughs> you just don't know. So again, yeah. uh, from our angle, philanthropically giving, you know, align ourselves with other businesses or creating other businesses that solve actual issues and problems that are still within, in my opinion, like the health and wellness space. I see, I see myself and, you know, our family and other close families investing into Airbnbs that are all wellness based strategically throughout the United States that will feature our product and other brands that are, that are, um, you know, cohesive with our product. And then, um, you know, from an athletic side, I'm not going to be training for hundreds anytime soon. Um, there's there's a health risk involved with that, and I don't want to put my family or my wife into a uh, position to where, um, you know, I would have to be in the hospital because I made a stupid mistake on a 100-miler because my ego gets in the way. Um, so I'm capping myself at, fi at 50 miles no matter what for any race for the next, you know, for the for the uh, foreseeable fe uh, future. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I again, I'm just really excited to – you know, take what we're building and change more lives along the way. And it doesn't have to be just through sauna. It could be so many different vehicles. Hell of a response there. And I hit home with so many of those, um, especially the, the philanthropic with Thrive on Life. Like one of my major goals of even doing well in business was to be able to invest in, in young entrepreneurs and young minds um, and give them the ability to just create ideas. I feel like when I was younger, there was just one path. It was like, go to college, get a degree, do the job. And I want to help people become the Peters of the world. Um, earlier on, I believe that we can do it. So education is a huge thing on mine. And I love that you're basically educating through everything that you're doing and everything that you're talking about, because you're not just talking about it. You're showing up every day and showcasing that you're about it. And it's amazing to see from far away and I'm looking forward to meeting you in person and maybe, Hey man, if you're running those 50 miles and you got a, a race that you want to buddy on, um, I'm looking to get into that arena after this 50 K at the end of this year. So would love to, to tag up on that. When is, uh, just so people know, when is, I don't want to butcher the name, the, the, the run up and down the hill. How, yeah. When how is that on, happening? Yeah. How long Hogsback is August 26th. So that'll be in Cleveland cool. and, uh, It'll be a 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, ordeal. There's three options. There's a one-hour fun run, which I think could be really nasty. I mean, it's a it's like a 15% grade to 20% grade, um, 250 feet, and it's just consistently over and over. Um, but then um, there's a two-man team option and then a, a solo uh, expedition, if you want to call it, where it's just that one person just constantly for 12 hours so. It'll be a good time. It'll be a big party. We will have a mobile sauna there. We will have ice barrels there. There'll be other vendors. It'll it'll be a big party. Hell yeah. I look forward to uh to seeing that. Um last questions that we always ask everybody. If somebody loved what they heard from you here today, how can they best get in contact with you? Yeah. Uh you guys could reach out to me via email. It's Pete at Sisu S I S U lifestyle.com. You could also reach out to me personally on Instagram, which is at Peter Nelson II. Um, and then, you know, I, I try to answer as quickly as I can from a message standpoint. So just reach out if you have any questions or just want to connect. Heck yeah. Please reach out to him. If you loved anything here today, Pete is the absolute man. Uh, and the saunas that they are putting out in the world absolutely rip and are changing lives. So I'm excited to hopefully connect you with somebody that, Let's integrate sauna into their life. Last question we always ask every everyone is if you were to define the word thriving, what does it mean to you? Passion and purpose, baby. Passion and purpose. And, you know, again, changing lives through your passion and purpose, that'll wake you up every single day. That'll light up fire underneath your butt and you'll just be operating all cylinders that way. 
Hell yeah. You don't know this, but at my old studio, uh, where we used to record the podcast, it literally, the guest would sit on a couch and right above them, it said, fuel your passion. Yeah. So that was like uh, the yeah. tagline of the podcast back in the day. Love that. That's so more cool. passionate people lead to, yeah, more passionate people lead to more purpose. Um, I'm a big believer in that. And yeah, there were so many takeaways here today at the end. I always talk a little bit about what the biggest takeaways were. Um, but I think something that you did really well, which you defined in the beginning, is just having structure and understanding why you're here on earth and, and what you're here to do and reminding yourself of that every single day. I think what you stated where happiness is like the stock market, it's going to go up and it's going to go down. But over the long run, if you're clear on what your purpose is and you're passionate about every day, like you're just, it's just going to continue to go up and continue to rise. And that was my biggest takeaway here today. So anybody that was listening, if you really enjoyed this, please share it with somebody that you think would also enjoy it. That's the best way we can get Peter's story out into the world and all the great things that he and the people at Black Flag and Sisu are doing, everything they're up to, as well as the philanthropic endeavors that he's now going on. Last but not least, please give us that five-star rating and review. We'd really appreciate that. Until next time, this is CJ Finley with Thrive On Life Podcast. Thrive on, you